Hello, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Aidan Flax Clark, and I am coming to you from the New York Public Library, where I put together Live from NYPL. And tonight we have a conversation about the legendary hip hop producer, Jay Dilla. Uh, there's a new book out about him, uh, his first ever biography, which is called Dilla Time. And the author of Dilla Time, Dan Charnas, is with us tonight. And he's gonna talk about his book, which is kind of equal parts biography, musicology, and cultural history. And we are so lucky that joining him in conversation is pianist and composer, Jason Moran. Um, I'm such big fans of both of them and just feel so lucky that uh, they're with us and I get to introduce them tonight, um, which is part of my job. The other reason I'm here is to just share with you a few library specific pieces of information, um, like how to get Dilla time from us and also about some of our other fantastic upcoming events. And maybe I'll start there because at the end of this month, we are so excited to be bringing back Live from NYPL into the actual library for the first time in almost two years. Uh, starting February 28th, we are gonna be returning to the library's Midtown campus at Fifth Avenue and 40th Street to kick off a full season of in-person programming. Um, on February 28th, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Timothy Snyder will come together to reconsider the work of the great historian Tony Jutt uh, upon the reissue of his 2010 classic, Ill Fares the Land. On March 10th, Henry Louis Gates and Andrew Curran are going to deliver the annual Robert B. Silvers lecture, which this year is entitled The, the Invention of Race. Um, and that is produced in partnership with the New York Review of Books. And on the Ides of March, March 15th, um, the world's most famous classicist, that's a quote, Mary Beard is gonna join a fashion icon and it turns out not so secret ancient history nerd, Tim Gunn, to talk about her new book, The 12 Caesars. Um, let's see, elsewhere in this season, there's just so much. Um, Elizabeth Alexander is gonna be with us, Fenton O'Toole, Cixin Liu, Margot Jefferson, Ada Limon, and many, many more. Um, we really hope to see you there in our new programming space at the Star Wars Niarcos Foundation Library, as well as, of course, the iconic Stephen A. Schwartzman building. Um, and if you can't make it, that's okay, too, because we're still going to have some virtual events throughout the season, and we're going to live stream as many of these in-person programs for free as we can. So to learn about all of it and to register, go to nypl.org slash live. Okay, back to Dilla time. Um, hopefully, you are watching this event on the NYPL website at nypl.org slash live. And if you are, in addition to this video, you will find on that page links to both purchase or check out Dilla Time, as well as links to some other really fantastic recommended reading that Dan shared for after you read uh, Dilla Time. Um, and seriously, if you haven't read this book yet, just don't waste another second. However you're gonna get it, get your hands on it. It's so good. Um, and if you are even a little bit interested in JD, I promise you, you are not gonna be able to put this book down. It was above and beyond one of my favorite reads of last year when I was lucky to get my hands on a copy of this. Um, the, and the link to purchase the book uh, sends you to our own library shop where not only do you get the book, but proceeds from your purchase will go to benefit the New York Public Library. Um, that said, obviously, if you'd rather borrow it, we will be very happy to lend it to you. I mean, that's what we do, we're a library. Um, and so all you need is a valid New York Public Library card, which I know everyone who's watching this and lives in New York already has, but if yours, I don't know, got wings and flew away or whatever, there is also a link on the event page for how to get a library card. Okay, so let's get to this conversation. Um, if you've got questions for Dan um, at any point, he'll be glad to answer them, uh, some of them at the end. Um, so start getting them ready now. Um, you can send them at any time using the chat, um, the Google form, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org. Um, that's publicprograms at nypl.org. We'll make sure that Dan sees them. And like I said, he'll get to as many of them as he can at the end. Um, also, if you're looking for real-time captions for tonight's programming, obviously you can click on the closed caption button on the video, or you can use the stream text link that we shared in the reminder email. And hopefully we are putting in the chat also right now. Uh, okay, that's it. So again, thank you so much for being here with us uh, for this really fantastic conversation. Um, and let's bring on Jason Moran and Dan Charnas. Boom. Hey there. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Man. And congratulations. One, congratulations. We, uh, we made it, baby. New York Times, uh, New York Times bestseller list. What, at number four, <laughs> this book about this producer and all of the beautiful family around him is number four, all that history. 
in these pages. Number four, Dan, come on, brother. I love it. I'm still in shock. I'm still in shock, but I am actually just as in shock that I get to share a platform with you. I mean, you know, I, I interviewed uh, close to 200 people for this book and a lot of his friends and family, their voices we know, mm -hmm. but I'm most proud of the fact that I got some new voices in there. You know, we're hearing from Roger Lynn, the man who invented the drum machine that Jay Dilla used to make his, his most important work. Um, Arthur Jaffa, uh, mm -hmm. speaking theoretically and deeply about um, both Dilla's rhythms and what they mean. And you, mm -hmm. Jason Moran, um, you know, just two hours with you, you know, during our first talk expanded my understanding of, you know, someone I already thought that I knew. So I'm just so happy that you're joining me here tonight. No, it's a, it's a real honor and a pleasure. And also, you know, there's a moment when when histories, music histories especially, are tricky to write about because the reason people make music is that is to elude, it's sometimes elude the word, you know, yeah. uh, and especially with instrumental music. And when we think about Dilla as a kind of, you know, not more than a conductor, more than an orchestrator, you know, then how do we talk about, you know, what he was able, able to create, you know, this, the world he was able to spin and uh and it and you and you really took on that charge and also to make it at a time not to wait 50 years to try to do this but right. to do it while it was still fresh in people in the community's mind about what his uh what his what his legacy is yeah it's, it's amazing thank you um well i i have a question for you to sort of kick it off um because one of the things that i sort of my central task as the book is to try to answer this question you know what's What's the big deal about Jay Dilla? Why do we talk about him? And I, you know, I think about you, you know, starting Suzuki piano in Houston as a kid, you know, becoming, uh, uh, gaining more mastery in a conservatory and all of that work and uh, skill and muscle memory and mental work. And I, I wonder, and I think people wonder, how does a trained traditional musician come to feel a kinship with somebody who really only uses a drum machine? Well, you know, one thing is I would argue that any musician is uh, they train themselves and mu as much as they'd like to give credit to their teachers that kind of were in the practice rooms with them. Yeah. It really is the family around them that teach them how to listen and how to learn. So Dilla talking, you know, or hearing about his mother, right? His mother's relationship to music, his father's relationship to music, that much of what he inherits is an inheritance. Uh, it's an ancestral inheritance. And it's the thing we kind of don't talk about in black music so much because black America is still so young and also so much of the history is still untold. And so to have to try to connect those dots about how someone learns music, learns sound, and then decides that they want to create sound. For me, it was just, you know, my parents trying to keep my brothers and I off the street in Houston, in Third Ward. And, uh, and they forced us to play music and I hated it. And, but it took, it took Thelonious Monk to save my life, which, you know, turned all the way to Dilla. For me, hearing that song Thelonious, his song Thelonious, and how he uses that word and how he flips that word to talk about singularity. Um, and it became so powerful to know that the person who drew me to the piano, right? A hip hop producer would also say would be, help them define what it is to be singular, what it is to have a voice. And uh, those are not easy things to do. There's a lot of backlash for wanting to be original, but we Aquarians, we don't, we don't, we don't flex on, you know, on. <laughs> Yeah. Or copying someone. No. <laughs> so yeah, that was one of the tasks that I, I put before myself. I, I felt like I couldn't just tell the story of this beat maker. I had to put him in context. His family was important. His city, Detroit, was right. important. Place. And the city, for me, became a metaphor. And the, specifically the grid. Right. Um, because, yeah. You break you broke that down so beautifully in the beginning of the book, right? Like I, when I was starting, I was like, "Oh, where are we?" You know, not where are we mentally, but where are we? And then you placed us, right? You placed us in this grid that then shifts, you know, 
the grid also then has something that 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 comes in at another angle the streets change you know and to understand that in some way the maps of these cities and the much of the surveying that goes around these cities also leaves an effect a metaphorical effect especially for people who then decide to shift the rhythm the way dilla did how did you did come to think about detroit and its history uh as a as a as a starting point for this it starts with coming to detroit for the first time i'm a new yorker by birth uh my first trip to detroit in 99 1999 was to work with jd i was a record executive uh and and producer and uh me and my my colleague chino xl we came to detroit seeking a couple of beats from this great beat producer jd right. and that's what he was he wasn't monk level in my mind he wasn't coltrane level he was just that dude mm. and we flew to detroit drove out to his neighborhood of conan gardens on seven mile road mm. went down to the basement there's common i had mm. no idea he was working on like water for chocolate at the time like that classic album that mm. was released in 2000 we did a couple of uh a couple of beats and we left i didn't even i brought my camera to detroit and i didn't even take it to take pictures of JD because I wasn't, I was taking pictures of us at the Motown Museum. I wasn't thinking that I was actually <laughs> at the basement. The I was Motown. In the it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got back to Los Angeles to mix the album mm. that I had sort of my first rhythmic revelation with JD mm. because his rhythms were, we started working with him right when his rhythms really changed. Mm. And what he was doing essentially was something that was rarely done before this mm. point as an as a unified aesthetic, which is to take straight rhythms and swung rhythms and put them in active conflict with each other to give that sort of jerky feeling, yeah. right? That drunken, yeah. loping, lurching, agitated, yeah, agitated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. of course, that's why I use the metaphor of the the street grid of Detroit because it's that rhythm. It looks like a JD beat mm -hmm. feels. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until later that I understood the, the, the magnitude of what I had experienced. Mm -hmm. It took me years. It took me until I became an author, uh, until I started teaching at NYU and seeing students, 18, 19, 20 years old, who are resonating with, how do you even know who JD is? I, like, how do <laughs> right. you know? Right. And then um, I was lucky enough to to, ma to marry into a family from Detroit. Uh, mm -hmm. And my very, first, my, my very first visit to Detroit was to work with Jay Dilla, JD, but my second was to meet my wife's family. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that first day, my wife or you know, my then girlfriend said to me, I'm gonna take you into Detroit and I'm gonna drive you around and I'm gonna mm -hmm. show you the city. And that not only brought all those memories back, but it began this sort of long uh, I suppose, you know, both a romance with the city, but also mm -hmm. a study of the city. And so mm -hmm. uh, a few years later, um, when I started teaching here at NYU, um, I started teaching a Jay Dilla class and we brought all 20 students on a field trip to Detroit That's for nice. three days. <laughs> That's deep. That was fun. Yeah. I mean, also Detroit is like mega music city, you know? I mean, Houston is something. I grew up in Houston. Houston is something else, right? But it's, I'd say it's becoming a music city. I mean, it has a music history, but Detroit is a music city. And what I mean by that is, I mean, when you go to Detroit to play music, you know you cannot front because everyone there listens, and they listen deeply. It's like Chicago. Like, people are listening, and they are not playing around with listening. And so there's also that kind of landscape that inherits that tradition of listening and of creating too and i guess when i was really thinking about detroit not only thinking about all the great jazz musicians who come from the city you know and all the great motown that is kind of birthed and that sound that goes around the world and changes the way the world thinks about the beat you know mm -hmm. but it's also uh the way that slum village defines where they're from where's this place we're from Coney gardens what motown right right so there's something that when you place yourself the thing that you are most proud of is your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, that's the wave you always are supposed to send out. And, um, and it's what brought me to New York too. So when I would come to New York and you get to Harlem, then you 
all of a sudden you think about these nice and smooth songs or you know right. jada kiss or whatever you know like you start thinking about like oh no the city also has that history you go to queensbridge you think about now you go to the bronx right you think about krs or whatever and that is how black music is also mapped across the country too black musicians getting to neighborhoods building something and then telling the rest of the world this is the safe space for us this is where we insulate our ideas our bodies our love our minds and this is what happens in the basements and it might not be just this basement but Dilla's basement clearly was a special space yeah people it was it, people i can't tell you why we wanted to come there instead of mm -hmm. having you know <clears throat> having him send the tapes to us it was uh it was like a pilgrimage and a lot of people made that pil pilgrimage glasper did mm -hmm. erica badu did you mm -hmm. know the roots and Questlove always did common did mm -hmm. it was something mm -hmm. um you know i in talking to you about dilla i often think about uh you know who he was as a as a as a boy as a, you know and and how did this impulse to play with time come about and mm -hmm. um he was a stutterer from very early on so he didn't talk a lot and that cultivated a pattern of listening rather than talking observance mm -hmm. um and i remember you talked about andrew hill like a correct uh, yeah. another jazz artist yeah there's something about the way people speak and the way they play you know uh and andrew hill is known for his kind of, I mean, I'm. it's not broken, the kinds of piano phrases he makes, but they start and they stop, they stop and then they double back on themselves and then mm -hmm. they come out and then they twist around themselves too. So he had a very kind of snake-like quality in the lines he'd make, but it's as if the snake was broken up into segments and then it all of a sudden jumbled back together. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's the way he spoke as well. And and so, yeah, reading that about, about him and also thinking about the way how smooth Lester Young plays the saxophone and then also how he speaks when he's uh, when he's off stage there's just something about how you hear your own voice and then you try to manifest it through for Dilla, through a machine you know but he's also manifesting it not simply through that machine but he's his ear when i talk about that way of listening that he inherits he's also hearing just the most beautiful excerpts of kind of of of, of his record collection and finding a new place to plant them, you know, uh, and thinking of that row that he plants these seeds in, not as simply this thing that loops around on itself, but it continues to evolve and always have a new gradation here, a new segment here, and then one sound emerges for two seconds only in a track and then disappears, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, thinking about this piece of audio that I want to I wanna play to sort of uh, illustrate this point, he turned what might be seen as a disability into a strength. Mm -hmm. um, he incorporated that stutter into his rhyme style. He also incorporated it into the rhythms that he used. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to give a little demonstration of this because we've been talking about it, but there's nothing like listening to it. So yes. I wonder if the DJ would play uh, a little clip I have of 10, number 10, untitled. Let's hear a little bit fun, of that. Fun, 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 fun. You're gonna hear him, you know, start to. Here we go. Dance and just push up your hands and this Come on for the band and if you can't stand one of my man stand sleeping on some sand man shit Come on. like damn man wake up and spring the action don't stand damn more like a grand slam hit Come on for the whole fam flipping on the handstand tip Come on we get the dough with it straight up the wham bam it's before we go go and get that on some damn wham shit uh, and like some second hand brand kicks uh -huh. rip, rip. from the deep down San Francisco to Japan land. It's the brand and new. Huh. We can't can't move for like the trans and do. Do, do, do. Don't stop. Can't can't quit. Can't can't. Can't can't. can't, can't Man. You hear it? Yeah. <laughs> He's. I guess, that's out of here. He's. His rhyme ahead, is following the kick drum. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, like this, there's, there's a thing about <laughs> in bands, sometimes bands talk about this. There's bands where horn players who people who are standing out front play as if the rhythm section, that's the drums and bass and piano guitar behind them will always just be there. Right. 
and you almost don't have to interact with them because then they can just take the solo that they want to take and not ever right. feel like they're getting interrupted by the people behind them, the rhythm right. section. Right. But Dilla faces the beat, faces it hard, like faces it, matches it, dives on it, slides on it, right? Like he treats that like, nah, that's the gold not to just skate on top of, but to live in. Um, and that, that, wow. uh, that also, listening to that also makes me think of that thing, you know, that DJs do where they have the same track and they kind of like slide the, slide the uh, fader back and forth too. Thinking about his DJ, his way that he hears as a DJ, as an MC, as a producer, as a member of a band. He's got a special perspective for his ear. And I think that mirrors what uh, you know, he sent me an Elvin Jones clip earlier talking about that same thing. Right. Wasn't he saying that? Um, that yeah. <laughs> Elvin Jones. Yeah. Elvin. This is a, a clip of Jeff Tane Watts, a great drummer uh, from Pittsburgh. He posted of Elvin Jones. I don't know. Maybe we watched some of it yeah. because I think in your book, you do this beautiful thing where you talk about making sure that we don't think and which is very wise. Sometimes we think that innovations within black communities come out of nowhere, right? With no context and, and no, no other history before it that said that this is possible in a sound. And that's a grave mistake. Um, but what then we see Dilla pick up on is something that Elvin Jones can uh, alludes to. But his musicians uh, centuries before that uh, were still also trying to figure out that problem. Uh, what do you think of the musicians who were playing, you know, these minstrel shows in the early 1900s in New York City and Broadway were thinking about? You know, James Reese Europe talks about syncopation. They called him the king of syncopation, you know, because syncopation was not simply about changing the beat as much as it was metaphorically about black people not waiting on the slow down beat of America. So that beat needs to be pushed ahead. It needs to slide ahead and needs to slide ahead soon. That's what happened in 1916, 1918 that we think about syncopation that way that then goes on to birth so much shift in black rhythm for the next 120 years, you know, up till now. So it's, it's a thing that we have to keep charting. And we have to keep, act, you know, like an accurate accounting of that chart too, because that is where our evolution also li lies. It's not simply in the laws that are produced uh, or, or, or fabricated. <laughs> you know, it's also in that, 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 that charting of that rhythmic territory and that's what you aim to do i would you know maybe we'll watch some of elvin jones talk about rhythm uh yeah. at a master class with his jazz machine t-shirt on all right let's uh, uh, see a little bit uh, of 13. era when where uh drummers did not uh you didn't make money you didn't make uh breaks uh the, the rhythm had to be very rigid and consistent. It was all very well. You know, you could almost you could you, 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 if, if once a person started a, a tune, uh, you could pretty well predict what the drummer was going to do at any different any given point in that in that in that composition. Almost the kind of solo that they were going to take. So I would I, I thought I thought that uh, you know my concept had, was a, a bit. Different. I, I thought that uh, you, I needed more free. To, for me, I need I need more freedom than that. I, uh, if I'm gonna, because uh, I think it's possible. It's possible for me at least. At least at that time, I had to, my chops were pretty, pretty well, pretty good. I can take a solo with one hand and uh, can uh, hold a, hold a, the the rhythm, hold a, the the rhythm of the, the symbol. Uh, rhythm uh, at the same time so i didn't need to take my hands i didn't need to interrupt the consistency of the of the of the rhythm in order to take a four bar solo for instance that's yeah that's that's remarkable to hear elvin jones talk about this because i think also elvin is um you know he's the great drummer from the john coltrane quartet <laughs> They innovate everything, you know? So in the same way that Dilla, yeah, he's kind of a John Coltrane quartet. When you were saying that he wasn't a train, I was like, nah, he was a train <laughs> before oh, 99. He was. I just didn't realize it. <laughs> he was a train before 99. And I think maybe the, the, the song, there's a couple of songs for me that just jumped out in the mid 90s when I moved to New York. Right. Because it was one, it was the Busta Rhymes song, Still Shining, that right. Busta Rhymes, I wish Busta talked more 
about some tape, you know, that JD sent him of all the beats that nobody could rap over. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and and Busta talks about still shining, and and he just and Busta did the thing that Dilla does on his beats. He faced the beat, and he did one of the most miraculous things uh, uh, in in a few minutes, uh, where he dove into Dilla's off beat and found a new home in it, and. And it did level up the game, you know. That one. Can we listen to that? Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 listen to a little bit of uh, number four still shining. How did this affect you? What did this do to you? When you I mean, heard the, it? Jo- the joy is in- insane because um, that's how I felt. Like the way Dilla made that beat is that's how I felt I should be able to comp as a pianist. It should be able to, you know, you know, maybe take you off off guard uh, as you know. And it's so it's interesting that Buster says, you know, ice capading over beats because he does find a way to do a miraculous r- routine, you know, during these Winter Olympics <laughs> uh, on that beat. And But for me, it was, it was also, there's something he does with rhythm, but there's also something that Dilla hears in harmony that, oh, um, that is equally as transfixing. And he somehow finds a home in, in these harmonies that a pianist would never <laughs> do. You know, he finds like, nah, that works. And then he... He retrains our ear harmonically too, uh, with the places harmony can go, the ways that they can resolve, the ways that they can be left up in the air. And uh, one of the things I also talk about for for Dilla is that he also found, you know, is a, he found the common tone, and a common tone is like the note in a song. You could sing one note and it'll always work, right? <laughs> and uh, and the harmony can be changing all around it, but you could just be singing that one note and. And he was able to do that. Running is a kind of a great example of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's, he, he embeds a sense of home in these pieces that seem so like, you know, like Rocky, you know, but they, but like Thelonious Monk, he made that. He's like, nah, this is the way it feels here. Just the angles is just a little off, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Let's listen to a little bit of running. Let's listen to that common tone. That's um, track two running. Common yeah. tone. Yeah, that yeah, that one. Da <laughs> right, those are the two common tones. You can stay on it all day. And he, you know, he like empties songs out, lets the lyrics speak, you know, brings the bass back in. I mean, that one really shook me a lot, um, as a listener, because I was like, oh, and it was before I was really thinking, like, who is that, you know, making these beats right. that I'm right. liking? <laughs> who made stakes as high? Right? Like, I wasn't thinking like that yet. But I would find myself, because I was still a student at Manhattan School of Music, going to the MIDI room, trying to make these beats like this. <laughs> right. Like in 95, 96. I was like, this is, look, we're talking about learning music. But wait a minute, there's somebody making new music right now. How come we're not be taught? How come we aren't being taught those methods? It's happening right now. It's happening on these streets right now. 
Wow. Um, and the guy who was teaching the class was like, yeah, no, nah, I'm not going to teach you how to use the sampler. So I'll wake up 6 a.m. and go in and try to figure out how to use the sampler, then try to make a beat. Because I was like, how am I gonna, how, and then trying to craft a sound to sound like the bass lines that Dilla makes too. Like, okay, you got to make that bass sound. <laughs> like nothing was as simple uh, as I thought. And it was humbling, you know? And then it just made me just kept listening for when was something else gonna come out of JD's basement to, to hit the rest of the world. Right, well, and it starts to, right? Like around 99, 2000, mm -hmm. we start to hear some of his ideas in, in other work. When were you sort of aware that these ideas were kind of starting to spread? Look, I, I I didn't care because for me, you know, I started playing those beats on stage in 96. <laughs> like, for me, they already found a home in my music. And um, and then I knew also that friends of mine, like when Robert Glasper moved to New York and was working with Bilal, that they were going out to be with Dilla. You know, so I knew that it was having a big effect on Robert, too. And, uh, and so also there was something in our hands that both he and I still gravitate to i just watched him on trevor noah last night he's still using that harmonic language that dilla teaches us it's not simply that rhythmic language um but that's when i start to notice it and you start to hear drummers start to kind of like make this this sound that is very similar and it you know and d'angelo i think really amplified that you know to a moment we're like oh wait a minute oh no this is this is a movement we're feeling right now yeah you know? yeah you know james uh jd you know he 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 felt some kind of way about that. I, I don't mm. there's this interview that he does that's a pivotal point for me in structuring the book where he he goes to Europe in January of 2003. And this is just before he gets sick. Mm. And what has happened to him in the last two years is he's finally uh, gotten himself a, a major label deal, an artist deal. He's kind of moved out of the shadows of his uh, mentor, uh, former mentor Q-Tip, uh, and now they're just relating as peers. Um, he's even sort of moved away from the Soulquarians, that group of musicians that includes D'Angelo and Questlove from The Roots and Erica Badu and, and so on. Um, and so he sits down for an interview uh, with um, a, a journalist in the Netherlands, and he says you know, he's kind of marveling at the fact that he works with these people. And he says, all I know how to do is work the MPC, you know? So I guess I must bring something to the table. Hmm. And at the same time, he's feeling very resentful hmm. that in hmm. the last two years, since he got free, everybody seems to be using his style, right? He yeah. thinks of it as his style. But yeah. I argue that's small thinking. He, he wasn't mm. just the beat maker. He mm. didn't know how big of an idea he had cultivated. Mm. Yeah, and I, I might say he did know a big, how big it was because of how frequently it was copied. There's this thing that the great uh, professor, uh, Dr. Guthrie Ramsey, I sat in on one of his classes when he was teaching at, at University of Pennsylvania, and he said this to his class. He said, there's a moment when innovation becomes rhetoric. You know, and, and, I, and, and I thought that is scary and accurate. And uh, and and I think that applies here, right? When we start hearing it morph outside of the basement in Conan Gardens to the rest of the world, then it ends up, you know, sound like something on a Michael Jackson record, right? Like you hear it kind of like going everywhere. I mean, you know, I mean, it's also normal, right? This is the part of being an artist. When you offer something to the world, the world uses the way that they want to, you know? But I, and, I, and I, that's why I love kind of like some of the later moves too, which is like, Oh well, I'm just gonna go to a whole nother batch of sounds. Right, y'all can keep that. I'm moving on, and that's an Aquarian. <laughs> like he might feel a way, but it's like, okay, well, you take take that. But I have something else to do, and it and it's gonna now sound like this. And I'd say that that shift, you know, reading that in the book, like hearing him now start to get no nothing with roads, you know. Right. <laughs> but, I don't want ever. I want to ever touch the roads again if I don't have to. And that was his sound. He just says, bye. <laughs> yes. And that's a brave artist, right? Because a lot of artists are stuck. As great as we think they are, they get stuck. Just like person who goes 
and does the oil changes, right? You know, or the children who go to school and, oh, I'm stuck in this class, right? But the artists get stuck too. And Dilla had enough f- flexibility and facility uh, to hear something new. And to actually, I think also maybe something that is, is exciting to think about is, the, is what he can use do with less. He's not looking for more, right? And his beats, you know, some of them are extremely minimal. And I think that play is also something Thelonious Monk does too. He could write an extremely simple song and then the next song be extremely complex, you know, with all the layers. Uh, so I think Dilla also uses that to his advantage. He has the flexibility that I can make it just a beat. I can make it just a sample. I can make it just a sound. I can make it just my voice, you know. Or what does he say in one of his songs? But chain swinging sounded like extra percussion, you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, like that for me is like he's acknowledging all the sound in his life and mm. nobody will be able to copy that. And it's, you know, people out here continue to much like the tragedy of when Charlie Parker died, mm. you know, what it did to the scene. And still to this day, people try to play like Charlie Parker, mock the same, you know, but they forget, you know, how original a life he was, you know. And and what the time that he lived in and, and, and how that informed the sound that he made that still impacts us and is still laid in the great foundation what the form of, is of the music that we play. Um, so Dilla also pressed so hard into rhythm that people, you know, are found themselves in his footstep still trying to get out of that, you know. Right. And do you think it's something that needs to, that has it become, has innovation become rhetoric at this point with... With Dilla Beats? With well, that. you know, the thing is that they always feel good. <laughs> right. You know, even some of the copies, you know what I mean? And um, well, that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like you said yeah. to me a while back, you said every generation, and this goes back to what you were saying earlier, every generation uh, has a different sort of twist on syncopation. You said something like that. Like every generation has their own advancement. And I remember trying to just, sort out with you even just for my own uh uh edification like what what does all this mean the fact that these strange broken rhythms mm. started coming into our music around 1999 2000 and are still with us yeah. what does it say about not only him but this generation that we're comfortable with this stuff that a lot of people when they first hear it think oh that's something's wrong yeah something's off right you know, but I, I think he, there's one thing that's addictive, and, and especially for us right now, the addiction to the machine, and that the machine will write our sensibility, <laughs> our human sensibility, right? right? And and he doesn't necessarily see that as something that should be, should that he should give the power to the machine. Yeah. He, yeah. he knows that the machine should be manipulated in a way to still acknowledge how he feels the rhythm. And if it can help him consider a new rhythm, then he's going to find it. Um, you know, like the machine is tricky because it also is doing a thing with, with, with pitch as well. I mean, we talk about auto tune and what that does and which is, I think is fine. People kind of correcting pitches, but you know, there was a time when music didn't necessarily have that for, for, you know, thousands of years. And so we're also training our ear in a way that we also, I think we should be careful of, you know, it's what the difference is from, you know, reading a novel versus reading an article. And, and seeing what that does and then talking about that article with someone else. I think Dilla makes stuff that you actually have to continue to reconsider. When I remember being in rural Louisiana playing a, a batch of beats for my uncle, who's the artist in my family, Joseph Moran. And, and we were playing and we were like on Cane River. <laughs> and I was listening to it with him and he said, man, this is like mantra music. And I was mm. like, right. So he thought of the beat not as like a a beat with, that you consider new landscape on he's like nah this is meditation yeah and and i and that that also helped open it open up my understanding of what the power of his music was too there is a duality to jd right there's a right. there is uh, i almost i call it like the donut and the grid and there's both sides so the grid mm-hmm. is that scientific intentional broken you know sounds erratic but actually is very intentional and there's a science behind it and yet there's the religiosity to dilla there's there's this evocativeness in his harmony uh radar ellis who teaches the dilla ensemble Mm -hmm. at berkeley he says 
you know, Dilla will um, extract a minor tonality from something that's major. Mm -hmm. And an another thing I notice he does is he, a lot of the, the ways that he structures his harmonic elements go from, from bright to brooding and then back again. And mm -hmm. so it's this sort of, there's always a little bit of an experience of melancholy mm -hmm. in a banging yeah. JDP. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, how do you acknowledge um, how do you acknowledge life in the art you make? Um, and some people really work hard to eliminate it, you know, from impacting the work they make. And I don't think that was his case. And uh, and he was surrounded by people who also wanted to make that happen. What I love watching is how people feel the beat in their bodies, you know. There's this clip of, of Slum Village where they're playing an intro where he sampled like a version of, of Feeling Good. Feeling good. Oh and watching, God. is it T3? Like T3. Go, when, go, like the way T3 feels it. That's how yeah. I feel. <laughs> I wish I had that clip queued up right now and I don't. He loses his, he loses oh his, he's like, he's calm for a second. And even before right. the beat drop, he's like, he's, he's in a new space. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's the thing that, you know, unlike your number four on the bestseller list, you know, that part of Dilla's work can't be charted, you know, right, his impact right. on bodies kind of across the world. That is that. And that is also our inheritance as listeners to his music, too, that we have to take care of um, is how he makes us feel. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's a it's it's a thing to honor in him, too. And all the way up until the tragedy of his death, you know, yeah. Um, yeah which is, you know, is its own discussion. And I wrote you after I finished reading the book that I kind of like immediately kind of like consulted my lawyer about my will um, and thinking about artists' relationship to, yeah. to when they, their estate and what happens to them when they're not yeah. around and, yeah. and how the music continues to, to, to offer us something in their, in their, in their, in their passing. Uh, and he, he, ch he kept, working and changing right up until the very end it never yeah. it never ended for him yeah. it was who he, change was who he was mm. yeah yeah and that look you know i think about artists and i'm sure we all do we think about Jimi hendrix you know like robbed at a young age you know even think about basquiat you think about janice joplin or i think about booker little the trumpeter you know or clifford brown um they were lost in their 20s you know and you know i'm in my mid 40s mid to late 40s and i know what i was thinking at 30 but i know what i was thinking at 40 too and you know just as he's turning a new page you know there was something about re-listening to donuts which is the beautiful thing about your book is it's it's its own playlist <laughs> you get to a sign you say wait pause while i read this i'm going to listen to this it's a beautiful thing um but when i got to donuts i was like oh and this is like when billy strayhorn wrote blood count from from the hospital bed you know all those beeps I heard in a whole different way that all the beeps that you hear in the hospital when you're a patient, yeah, you know, that are, they are, they are off. They are consistent. They are tragic. They sometimes affirm that you're getting better, you know, that they also show up in donuts in a way that I had never heard before. And really thinking right. about where he's placing that in his life in understanding what possibly his, his, his transition might feel like yeah. he leaves that mark. You know, fingerprint on on the on the sound too. And even then, there was some debate, even among the people who helped him bring donuts into the world, about whether these things that were in donuts were intentional or not. You know, intentional messages in mm. the music. Mm. Um, there's a lot of myth around uh, Jay Dilla too. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say this: I, I know that uh, they're telling us that uh, Q and A shall start uh, oh, yes. shortly, <laughs> but. Um, but I didn't want to say this. I, I thought about, obviously, your speaking with you helped me um, intellectually sort of formulate uh, my thoughts and, and even the structure for the book. But uh, something else, actually, I, I read, a, I think it was a New Yorker piece, and um, the, the journalist who was writing about you, he was observing you teaching. I think it was at the New England Conservatory or uh, somewhere in Boston you were teaching. And you were telling mm -hmm. a student, unfold the song slowly. 
And I've always thought about that as this, I'm rowing this little boat, you know, across the ocean that mm -hmm. it is just, it's going to take time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I thank you for that. And thanks for, for helping me <laughs> on this journey. Yeah. But, but really also Dan, thank you for taking the time to put this history down. You know, I mean, how many books are written by Abraham Lincoln? You know, how many books written by Martin Luther King, you know, how many books and then think about how many books are written by Nina Simone, right? Like, like yeah. how many times do we need to tell this story? You know, do we need to continue to unfold his life again, you know, on some pages, you know, yeah. on some new batch of beats? One thing that I wanted to say about hearing his music over and over was I would meet people in Detroit. They take me in their car and they say, okay, now listen to these beats, right? <laughs> or I'd be at the Monterey Jazz Festival and I'd meet with Kareem Riggins and he's like, yo, come to the car. I want to play you some of these beats that Dylan just gave me. Like there was something about hearing his music also in a car, you know? Right. In Motor about Motor City. <laughs> you know, that also is the great migration. It is all the metaphors we need about movement. It's about change, you know, changing yeah. scenery, that the beat's going to take us there. Um, there's just something about hearing his music that, you know, that you were able to put down in these pages and talk to all these people, these people who let who told you very personal aspects of his of his life um, yeah. that we need to read and see. Yeah. Well, I I, I, I sometimes uh, joke that it was like um, doing marriage counseling on 200 people all at once. It's a <laughs> it's a it's a community that very much needs healing. And I do come by it honestly as a journalist because my mother is a marriage counselor and psychotherapist. So some of it has <laughs> rubbed off. But uh, the intention is healing, right? The intention is, is empathy and love and letting everybody tell their stories. It's a fugue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, to use another yeah. musical metaphor. So yeah. I'm going to let you pick the first question, Jason. Do you see this in the um, chat? Can you talk about how beats can be corporal bodily Ooh. as well as sonic love that idea in the book Dan. i wanted yeah. i wanted to say that that was a search that was one of my searches right what why did he do what he did mm -hmm. and what's so amazing is that when i finally there were a number of sources for the answer but they all said the same thing right mm -hmm. so first i went to his brother john who's about i don't know um, maybe 10 12 years younger than him and uh john said oh that's easy it's how we move. He literally said, and he said, it, it's how he did this. So it's how we move. It's a <laughs> physics of movement. Yes, yes, exactly. I kid you not. A few months later, I'm reading VJ Iyer's doctoral dissertation. And he's talking about how the body cannot be divorced from, uh, uh, you know, time right musical time and that mm. it isn't some celestial clock up here it's mm. corporal time and that uh swing approximates sort of the locomotion of the of the body you know the arms mm. and the legs swinging and he said a physics of movement yeah. same words yeah right yeah. uh yeah. and then uh young rj who was an associate of slum village a producer of slum village now you know obviously a member of slum village he was uh, kind of an assistant to James, especially as he got sick. And mm -hmm. he said, James started talking to him about his process. And James mm -hmm. said, uh, he asked, why do you do that? Why do you rush the snare? Why do you break the grid like that? Why do things come in too early or too late? And he says, it's how I bob my head. Right. That's it. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's it. The, 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 the body and musical time cannot be divorced. Yeah, there's a study I think that should be done around how head the head nod continues to change, right? From what it sounded like, what it was in the 70s, what it was in the 80s, what yeah. it was in the 90s, where people were nodding their head. I think it's a local thing too. I think it's regional. Yeah. I remember when I saw videos of, of cat, when I was still in Houston, cats in New York, the way they, they nodded their head on the other side and I started nodding my head, like trying to get it like, oh, right. wait. And when you do that, you feel the music totally different, right? Watching T3, like, oh, okay, <laughs> I was on. Right. <laughs> like here, like watching, there's a video of of, um, of Slum Village doing a sound check. I'd like some, I want to say it somewhere, I don't know where it was. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of like, you know, Dylan's setting up, he's talking about how he's going to make beats live on stage, right? Yep. 
and he's playing stuff and like like T three is back there and you see how T three hears it. I think S V was like the luckiest band, right? Like the their personalities and and the way they sat in that beat. They I don't know. There, it was no they no comparison. <laughs> Shout out to T3. No, no, no comparison to what they were they were doing. Frank and Dink, all of them, Fat Cat, all of them, the way they felt it. Yeah. Like that's a it's a Detroit thing. And yeah. um and yeah, the body always has to do with it. You know, I mean Dr. Billy Taylor, who was my predecessor at the Kennedy Center, uh, Dr. Billy Taylor Taylor sat me down very early and was like, you know, are you still ma- are you making music for people to dance to? I had to think, so I was like, hey. And not a few years later, I did the Fast Waller dance party to address that issue in my own music to make sure <laughs> I would get people up out of their seats and they should they should be able to have a good time and I should be able to get them out of their seats and do it the way all the old piano players used to do. Right, you know? right. Um, okay, so next question. I'm going to pick next question. I'm going to give it to you. Right. Do you have a favorite part of the book, Jason Moran, oh. or something that stuck out to you that you didn't previously know? <laughs> yes. You know what one it was? It was, um, it's, a, it's early on, it's about routine, you know? It's, it's on page, oh my glass, it's on page seven. But you talked about what he would do, you know, how his refrigerator was, how his basement was, you know, right. how he cleaned, you know, like this routine. An artist has to figure out the routine. Yeah. Even if the routine, there is no routine. But much like Toni Morrison talks about waking up very early in the morning before her children would get up to start the writing of her novels, you know, there's something about that early morning thing that um, and and reading about Dilla having a routine, which I wouldn't say I would have thought about until later as I learned more and heard more from other people about it. But mm-hmm. you pulled that up that 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 this is an artist with a routine. It's not just that he happens up on this stuff. Yeah. It's like now nah, he's like. It's it's he's baking it consistently, you know. Always, uh, Frank, his uh, one of his oldest friends and you know longtime sort of right hand, he said that everything that James did served his primary directive. Whether he was going record shopping, buying clothes, mm-hmm. uh, going to the strip club, which was a you know mm-hmm. a, a regular activity for him as a young man, all of it served to put him in the headspace. Mm-hmm. to make beats mm-hmm. and and i think the, the book bears out really nothing else mattered yeah yeah that was that was that was touching i guess also the other part was thinking about the people who helped you know like who heard it like tip hearing it q-tip hearing it and being like yo everybody needs to hear this right and then like just shouting it like as so yeah. you know as kind of an evangelist a dilla evangelist uh and common right bringing them out to la you know like saying look Maybe I can help you get better out here, you know, uh, like like they're really trying to care for the possibility that they hear in the music, too. Um, that's also thinking about that, that relationship and the importance of of community. But really, what is it? I really think the, but the, really the importance of collective. That's what it really is. It's yeah. the importance of artistic collective. And um, and I think you really amplified that, too, is, you know, that he couldn't have done this without the collective, you know. I mean, it, what's I guess the one of the surprising things, I don't know if maybe, yeah, I guess it is surprising, you know, as it dawned on me that here is this young man who everybody is sort of drawn to hmm. um, and everybody wants to take care of. And it's not just mercenary. It's not just because uh, they want him, they want his beats, you know, they want to rhyme over his beats or he's a pathway to some future in right. show business. They mm-hmm. just want to take care of him, whether it's in Detroit or after he moves to L.A. You mentioned that gesture that Common made to him, like, come out to L.A., live with me, you'll get better. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. when he was on tour, when he was in the hospital, everybody Mm -hmm. was, they organized themselves around literally uh, making sure he was cool and keeping him alive. It's Mm -hmm. that was the thing for me Mm -hmm. that shows, again, that 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 magic of of who he was and there was a, a magic to it um, yeah yeah and also you know i mean the other thing that shows up is you know we recently lost mf doom you know dmx uh more and more people who you know could still be here um is we also are looking at in the way that we lost charlie parker or billy holiday you know um we're also looking at 
how health, how important it is, and sometimes it's assumptive that it will remain with us. Yeah. But as hip hop ages, uh, the health of hip hop also ages, and that it is something that really has to be kind of brought up to the fore. And it's not simply body health, you know, yeah. mental health, financial yeah. health, you know, community, family health, you know. All of those really need cultivation as it starts to age. Jazz kind of, you know, and it's whatever kind of word that is, but as a form is now 120 years old, right? So we've seen enough of the greats kind of come, go, all kinds of deaths, all kinds of afterlives. And we feel them still to this day. And I think as hip hop ages, we're watching it. Like, you know, those of us who grew up in it are watching it. And, um, and you know, and it still takes some tending to. And I think Dilla's story is also part about that too. How do how does the music age? How does the artist age? Mm -hmm. And uh, and the and the, the trappings of it, you know, yeah. it's very difficult. It was hard, you know, getting to the end of the book because um, it was a wake up call. Wow, that's that's it's amazing to hear as an author. No, it's um, powerful. You pick the next question, Jason Moran. Let's see. Um, Oh, which interview led you down the deepest rabbit hole? Can I tell you something? It wasn't about Dilla, but it was about his father. There was this rumor, uh, and it was, uh, you know how it is on the internet, it's just repeated as fact, mm -hmm. that Beverly DeWitt Yancey, who was his father, who was a musician in Detroit in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, ghost wrote the song, It's a Shame which in reality is credited to Stevie Wonder, Lee Garrett, and Sarita Wright, uh, and uh, was performed by the Spinners in 1970. So I, had, I was on a quest to find the answer to this. So I found DeWitt's ex-wife, Alice mm -hmm. Garbo, and she said, I saw him write it. So, okay, that's a check mark over here. Right. But then nobody at Motown remembered him. Dennis Coffey, who played guitar on the song, didn't remember him. Uh, you know, uh, 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 I spoke to who else did I speak? Paul Reiser, who did the arrangement on the song, and mm -hmm. finally I spoke to G.C. Cameron, who's the mm -hmm. lead singer of the Spinners, mm -hmm. and he said, "I'm not aware of uh, any Dewitt Yancey. I just know that Stevie and I were hanging out one night, uh, and he said, let, 'Let me come back to come back to my mom's place because Stevie lived in his mother's basement, Lula Mae Hardaway's basement, and he mm -hmm. gives this." perfect description of the basement the clavinet is right here and he says stevie sits down at the clavinet and plays mm. and then he said two days later we went to the studio and recorded it Oof. wow so then i had to i had to try to the, the closest i got to stevie uh was his brother uh calvin mm. hardaway mm -hmm. um who said no stevie did not get that song from anyone else <laughs> it was not an unheard of practice for Hello. for musicians and songwriters to do, but right. um, you know it sounds like a Stevie Wonder song to me. So I don't I don't necessarily I'm not able to answer the question with mm -mm, but that's the one though. But yeah, yeah. But also what you pull up, you know whether you knew it or not. But you talk about this basement when you were describing the basement. I just was thinking about Odilla's oh, basement, right? Like the, where these instruments are living, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and what's coming out of there and getting credited to someone else, you know. Uh, and there's also, there's this, you know, there's also this way that um, communities hear one another and maybe not acknowledge one another. Mm -hmm. And um, and it is consistent in music because music is traded in the air. It's not traded on paper. I heard it, you know. I've heard even one artist, very famous artist, walk into a room and hear another p a piano player, their piano player, their singer, playing a song, and and, and then the the singer saying, "Oh, you yeah, know, that's my song," you know, yeah. <laughs> owning it <laughs> as right, someone right. else plays it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so there's something about that. I love that because that's also the kind of research that it takes too. You know, when you when you hear stories like this about. Where where's the inceptions of these these great songs, you know? But and maybe that's for for Dilla, right. that last part about his his Motown thing is is I think when he turns back around and faces that mantle, that monument of sound, and what he decides to to kind of reshade on that, mm. 
I mean, that could be addressing that. <laughs> yeah. J- Jason is referring to uh, what Dilla fans call the Motown tape, also called the Dill Withers uh, CD, where he masticates all of this 1960s soul, a lot of it Motown, and in a way that's very, very fractured and in a way that is sort of a response to and a one-upmanship of Kanye West mm-hmm. at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm told that we have like a minute left. Um, and so I just, I think with the minute I have left, I just want to thank you, Jason, for, for, our, uh, for, for helping me articulate this argument and for um, just for being the creative mind that you are. Uh, well, thank you, Dan, and congratulations on this work. Uh, and thank you to all of those, you know, people who sat down with you to help get that history down on paper. Thank it you. Is, to you know, this this goes to Timbuktu. This book, you know, as 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 part of the annals of our rhythmic history, which will need to be continually told till the end of time, because that's where our freedom lies. Right, yeah. So well, thank you, Dan, for doing that, brother. It's it is has been my honor and pleasure and and a compulsion. A yes, compulsion. I had to do it say that <laughs> all right thank you jason thank Cheers. you everyone for, for spending some time with us good night thank you for joining us for more information and to register for upcoming programs visit nypl.org